Hi, and welcome to uh, the Whiskey Masterclass. Uh, with me, Martin McCauley. Um, I'm the Sunday Life newspaper whiskey reviewer. I also own uh, UlsterWhiskey.com. Um, the reason I call my company and website Ulster Whiskey is because the province of Ulster is fundamental and key to the whole whiskey story. It actually comes from the, the province. There is legends going back hundreds and hundreds of years as to the origins of whiskey. Um, never 100% sure, but what we do know is that it was distilled by monks. Now the monks, this was during the Dark Ages, were from Ireland. So Ireland was known as the land of saints and scholars. So as these monks went across continental Europe, uh, particularly one known as St Columbanus, who was located in Bangor, up in the monastery in Bangor, he went across to the continent and legend has it that he discovered guys about to sacrifice a barrel of beer to the god Odin. Now, this so horrified this Ulster man that he screamed so loudly he burst the barrel of beer. He said, that, no, 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 you do not have to sacrifice anything. My god wants you to drink the beer and just thank him for it. And they said, we like this, and we're immediate converts. Now, they then showed him this art of distillation. Now, the, these were alchemists. Alchemists have a bit of a bad press. They, it's always seen that they want to turn something into gold to make money, but that wasn't actually what was going on. What alchemy was, was this art of transformation. And th the key was to get to gold, because gold is pure. Gold doesn't tarnish, it doesn't rust, it doesn't change. So they thought that everything that was in process chemical reactions, iron rusts, that gold was what it was aiming to be. So they were trying to find out how this, done to, how this process worked. So they distilled beer, and suddenly out came this clear liquid. Now, first person to drink this, dead as a doornail. When you distill beer, which is essentially what we do today, the first cut that comes off is methylated spirits. This, the last bit that comes off are fusel oils uh, and, and really heavy chemicals, um, phenols and so on and so forth. Really, really don't drink those because they're really bad for you kids, okay? But somewhere along the line, they discovered that they could drink the bit in the middle. Now, what they were using it for on the continent was perfume, and they called it aqua vitae, the water of life. Uh, so why did they call it that? Because if something was infected, you put alcohol on it, it cleaned it of infection. Now they perfumed it because they thought smells cause disease. Now they didn't understand the process, but they kind of had it right. So the perfumes, that was okay, that was good enough for the people in Germany and France, but not good enough for the people of Good Ulster. When they came back, they discovered you can drink this, and that was the key difference. Now, Ulster, we know that the monks went across to Scotland, and they took this art with them. So, uh, distilling and distillation in Scotland, this huge five billion pound a year industry, really started here, its origins are here. Now, as the plantation of Ulster happened, the Presbyterians came over. These days, we think of Presbyterians as being really quite conservative and austere, that wasn't the way they were back in the day. They were really the party people of, of religious party guys, you know. Basically every home had its own still. And as these guys came over, there's documented evidence of ministers telling guys not to drink whiskey in church. Now we can't really see, can't really figure that out today. It seems very different, but that's nonetheless what it was. As the planters went then across to the US, they went to Louisiana, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, all of these areas, and they took distillation with them. Now, the American War of Independence has been called uh, a Scots-Irish uprising in many, at many times at the time. Uh, contemporary accounts call it that. Now, Washington's a huge section were these, these Scots-Irish. Now, the very first rebellion in American history, the Whiskey Rebellion. After Washington gained independence, 
he decided to pay off the war debt with taxes on whiskey. And the Scots-Irish in, in the US rise up in rebellion. So the American whiskey industry really traces its origins to here as well. Now, in Belfast, we're doing the Imagine Belfast Festival. Whiskey played a key role. A man called Alfred Bernard came to Ireland. He went all across the UK, but he came to Ireland to visit every whiskey distillery uh, that was, was open. And he has this in a documented account. It's been republished many times. You can buy it online, and it's fantastic. It tells you all the history of the, the distilleries in Scotland and down in Dublin and so on and so forth. When he came to Belfast, there was three distilleries. So you had Dunville's, a massive operation. You had the Conswater Distillery, which was potentially the biggest of the three. It didn't ever really get to maximum production. And to give you an idea of the scale of it at the time, they would have been capable of producing over six million gallons in the 1880s. So this was a huge trade. The third one was the smallest of the three, the Avonil Distillery. And we don't know a huge amount about it because they wouldn't let Alfred in, which he wasn't overly impressed about. Later than that, 1900, whiskey was a huge export for Ireland. 8.8 .8 million gallons a year was being exported from Ireland, but 6.6 .6 of it was coming out of Belfast. It was a huge trade. And when people talk about the big industries of Belfast, they talk about shipbuilding, they talk about the linen works and tea and rope. But no one really talks about whiskey. And there's a bit of a reason why. As we know, the Volstead Act in the US brought in prohibition. This decimated the Irish whiskey industry. At the time, Irish whiskey was bigger than Scotch. And what happened was, when it was, uh, prohibition was brought in in the States, a mark of quality would have been Irish whiskey. But the bootleggers knew this. And what they did was, they copied Irish whiskey brands because the likes of Tullamore Dew, which we'll get to later on. When Babe Ruth was swinging his baseball bat in Yankee Stadium, Tullamore Dew adverts were behind him. These were, these were huge, well-known brands. So they copied these, but it was gut-rot, horrible whiskey. Um, it quickly, it became from a mark of quality to really a mark of, a mark of uh, just bad whiskey. Now, another thing was the, the heavily smoked peated whiskies in Scotch. It was easy to buy a barrel of it, and you could have 100 barrels of bad whiskey and dilute the Laphroaig and Ardbegs and this kind of thing in that, and it gave a, a bit of a milder peaty flavour, and Americans got more of a taste for it. Now, the Dunville's story, they are kind of unique. Dunville's was huge. Uh, they had their distillery up on the Grosvenor Road, and you can still find traces of, of remnants of it, Distillery Street, and Dunville Park, etc, etc. That was all given by the, the, the distillery. They were a big going concern. Now their main offices, you can still find those, they're over on Alfred Street, over, uh, Arthur Street, sorry, over, they are the Cuban Revolution, it used to be Cafe Vaudeville, that was the former offices of Dunville and Sons. Now, right up until the 1930s, they were still making money. These were still in profit. They probably had the largest whiskey store of any distillery in the world. But in 1936, they closed. And the reason they closed was all of the Dunville's family, barring one, had died. There was no family member really to carry it on. But there was also the temperance movement had still carried on. There was still a lingering bit of the, the temperance movement. And Really, they just thought, we'll wind it up. So they wind it up, 400 people out of work, and paid off the shareholders. Now, they have more or less disappeared. However, the brand has been bought by, well, the wonderful guys down at Ecklandville, down in County Down, just outside Kirkubbin. And they have brought it back. Now, there's a lot of this. There's a lot of these new brands. Uh, I call them the Lazarus brands. They've all risen from the dead. They've been dead for decades and sometimes centuries, and now they're all coming back. But this is not a bad thing. If you take another new one, 
uh, the likes of Kirker and Greer. The Kirker and Greer buildings down beside St Anne's, you can still see their names uh, from 1912. So go and check that out. These new brands, Irish whiskey's coming back. What a lot of people don't appreciate was that in the 1970s, you essentially had one distillery in the whole of Ireland, and that was down at Middleton. Bush Mills was still there, but because no one was drinking whiskey, it basically was only running for about three months of the year. So essentially you had one distillery. All of the Irish whiskey brands that we're familiar with, Pars, Jameson, uh, Tullamore Dew, all of these were all made at one distillery. Now, we have 26 and counting, but most of them aren't actually ready yet. But it's coming. It's the fastest growing drinks market in the world, Irish whiskey. Now, what's so special about whiskey? Why is it different than every, pretty much every other spirit? Rums, okay, they're in the same park. Cognac, mm, not really, because they don't really carry the same gravitas. They don't really carry the same uh, geographical appeal, if you like. Brown spirits are a lot more complicated than what we call white spirits. So your vodkas and your, your gins and this kind of stuff. Basically, they're, not, they're a different animal. Normally with a gin or a vodka, you add something to it. So you'll have a, a cocktail or base for something else. Whiskey, lots of times you just drink it straight. Now, when you take the flavor products, flavor compounds in say vodka, vodka is essentially ethanol and water. So I see people paying big money for Grey Goose vodka. Okay, it's, it's just a bit more of a craft to it than your cheap, cheaper versions, but there's not really a huge difference in taste. When it comes to whiskey, you have a huge range. And that comes from one, the way it's distilled, and two, really the way it's cask. You have age statement whiskies, you have blended whiskies, single malts, single grain whiskies, you have pot still whiskies, but they're all in the same family. Whiskey is essentially a grain spirit distilled and aged in a cask. Now, in Ireland, it's slightly different than Scotland. Scotland, it has to be aged in an oak cask. In Ireland, it just has to be aged in a wooden cask. And you'll know this will be more of a feature later on in years. You'll see this a bit more uh, prominently. Now, we get to the fun bit. How do you drink a quality spirit? I have a selection of whiskies here on the table, and I'll just talk through a few of these. Um, now, the range in price. You can buy a fairly bog standard whiskey, it'll be a blend up whiskey, um, for about £20 a bottle. My go to whiskey of a day is Black Bush. Now, this bottle of Black Bush, it's a little bit special. Whiskey has another property. It's essentially immortal. It lives forever. This is a bottle from the 1960s. Now, this was distilled at Bush Mills before I was born. Now, I bought this bottle at auction. It's a little bit more expensive than the, the stuff you buy today. Bush Mills in a supermarket today, about £25. This bottle cost me about 40 But I like it because of the heritage of it. This Okay, it's not far away from being done, but I like the idea that this is older than I am. And what other food stuff or product or whatever can you actually ingest and take and eat and drink that is 60 years old, 50, 60 years old? Now, as I say, you can buy these bottles at auction. They're not very expensive. I know there's people who have bottles of this at home and hanging on to it. Um, personally, it's never going to be worth a huge amount. Probably just better having it as a drink. Now that's my go-to. Now, Bushmills 10. Bushmills is a single malt. Um, this would be really the first of the, 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 the more expensive Bushmills. But this is really 10 year old. This is an age statement. What that means is it has to be in a cask for 10 years. It doesn't matter if this was a 1960s bottle. This is still only a 10 year old whiskey because that's the minimum length of time that this is sat in a cask. Now the variations in this can be huge. You imagine 
and this cask is sitting over beside a, a, a window. It'll be warmer than the one sitting over a, a shade. So there's a difference. It takes on more characteristics of the oak. It takes on more characteristics of the, 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 the barrel, as we would say. Now you have to have the, a consistent product, even though these variations. You're working with a natural product, an oak cask. Each oak tree is individual. So this, the craft that goes into something like this is really something special. Now this, this is about 35 pound a bottle, possibly a little bit expensive in comparison to some um, single malt scotches, but still a quality product. Um, Bushmills make an amazing, a fantastic core range of stuff. This is a little bottle of Tullamore Dew. Now, when I say about the casks, this is a cider cask finish. The, cast, the oak cask that this was aged in previously held barrel aged cider. Now, that imparts obviously a different flavour, different characteristics. It's quite light, it's what we call estuary, so it's got that sort of green fruit uh, essence to it. Tullamore Dew kind of has that anyway. So it has uh, fresh apple notes anyway, cider cast, to try and bring those out. Personally, no, didn't think it really works as well as I thought it did. Um, this, this, is, this is okay, it's worth trying because it's, it's something fundamentally different than, say, scotch, if you're used to drinking that kind of thing. This, this is a 15 year old Red Breast. Now, Red Breast is a pot still whiskey. Most people don't know what that means. Um, pot still whiskey is different from single malt, it's different from grain whiskies. Pot still whiskey is unique to Ireland. It's a PGA product, it's a protected geographical indication. This can only be made in Ireland. And how it came about in the late 18th century, Irish Parliament passed a tax on malted uh, barley, which meant that your malted whiskies really became more expensive. So the Irish, being very savvy as they are, decided to make a whiskey that was a mix of malted and unmalted barley. And they came up with pot still. Now that gives it a much more peppery, spicy finish to it. Um, it's quite light, it's triple distilled, as opposed to your scotches, which is double distilled, which would have double distillation, gives it more of a body. Triple makes it slightly lighter, so they make it slightly more spicy characteristic. This is 15 years old, it sits in a barrel, minimum 15 years. Pot still whiskies, you're going to hear an awful lot more about them. They will become much, much more popular. So, 15 year old red breast. Now this, coming in this rather lovely pack, a little lovely case. This is Middleton Very Rare. This is a flagship pot still whisky. Now the reason I brought this, it's a rather beautiful ball, is this was bought to me by a very, very dear friend who lives very far away as a Christmas present. Now, as I say, this was, whiskey is immortal. So, you can see there's not a huge amount drunk out of it. I've only drunk a few out of this. This is a quality product. This is really the flagship pot still whiskies in Ireland. Now, they release it every year. This is the 2018 release. Um, and it's a limited edition range every year. Now they've changed the style of the bottle. They changed that two years ago. If you want to see a full collection of this, go over to the friend at hand over in the Cathedral Quarter. Willie Jack has a full collection of this. Probably worth 60, 70 thousand uh, pound. And escalating probably quite rapidly. When you are drinking whiskey and your quality product, do not drink these two the same way. This, this you need to add Coke, or just don't drink that evening. What you can't, what most people do is, they normally drink out of something like this. This is not for drinking a premium product, okay? You do not drink this out of this. This is a, it's a Jack Daniels labeled glass, which you'll put some ice in, and probably some coke. This would, to do these two would be sacrilege. This would be awful. 
you may have something like this, a big tall glass. This would be for cocktails, but this is a Bush Mills glass. This is one of the promotional glasses that I picked up along the way. This is actually a branded Middleton glass. Now this is a bit more like the thing, because what you're beginning to see with this is the glass narrows. And what that does is, that means that when you go to nose it, I'll get to that later on what nosing means, it makes it easier, it makes it more an intense flavour, it, it, it lifts it and gives it and carries it along. Now, now we're getting on to really something that is more like what you should be drinking this out of. When the guys who blend these whiskies up, the blenders, uh, not, not imaginative name for them, blenders go around sampling their casks. They use this type of glass. Now this is a Capita glass. Um, some people might know it as a sherry glass. And what they do is, they go around and they nose the whiskey. They look at it, they'll nose it, probably taste it. Probably, um, unfortunately, probably as a scarred it because of driving home. But this will be more of the glass they would use. Now at home, you buy this. This is a Glen Cairn glass. Now this was designed by the uh, blenders in Scotland. Now the reason it's like a thick glass base, you can drop it. You know, it can actually drop and still stay in, in good shape. These glasses, uh, I, have, I sometimes sell them when I'm doing whiskey tastings and stuff because people want this kind of thing. Now, what we'll do is we'll pour a little bit of this into your glass. Not a huge amount. Now, this goes into the glass. Now this is pretty much, a, it's a fairly small measure, probably about 25 mil. Now, there's kind of three steps to tasting a whiskey. Um, the nose, when you, you smell it, then you taste it, it goes into the palate, and then the finish, the follow through. So there's three stages, and a quality product like this is designed to be enjoyed. This shouldn't be drunk quickly. Normally I will have a beer, or normally a couple of bottles of Belfast Black Stout or a couple of bottles of Guinness to complement this. And I, I'll drink that more and sip over this. Now when you get your whiskey, what you do is you circle it round the glass, give it a look at the colour. Now, one of the products that they are allowed to put in whiskey without telling you is a colourant, uh, E150A, which is a caramel colourant. Unfortunately, some people put this in because they make it, to try and make it look older. Um, mostly they do it to standardise the product, but some of them put in a lot of it. They make you think that it's been in the barrel a lot older, longer than it has. Now, get your whiskey, swirl it round, okay? And then what you do is, you nose it. You bring it up to your nose, let, let it come to you. Don't you go looking for it. And you smell, and you get these lovely floral notes. Um, it comes up, it, 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 it's like, um, F roses, it, it, it's that sort of lovely floral, um, nice red fruit, um, red apple, a uh, little bit of little bit of wood, little bit of nut to it, and you're getting these different different notes, different characteristics. And when I when I get that, and I think this was bought to me by a, a very dear friend. I do that and it brings back, it should bring up memories, it should bring up that, that closeness or if you've been to the distillery it should remind you of the distillery, it should remind you of a trip you've taken or an experience you've had and this is all to do with it. You bring around your friends, get a couple of these wee glasses, get your friends, have a snap. Don't just, this is not this kind of rushed through drink, this is an experience and with a quality product like this, this is what it's for. When people say to me, you spend £120 on a bottle of whiskey, yeah, but I could have 
a reminiscence about a friend or uh, a bottle that was given to me by a great aunt. And every time I'm going to open that, I'm going to remember those. And it's, it's an experience. And I can have that with this style of measure 20 times, 25 times over years and years and years. A hundred pound? What is it? You know, it's, it's not even a good meal for two, really, you know. So, anyway, smell it. Let it, let it go around, let it, it's lovely, it's really nice, really nice. Now, now when you taste it, now, there's the tasting. What you want to do is you want to make sure you're hydrated. Take some water on board, drink your water, because that way your palate's ready for it. Now you take a taste. That's lovely. It's really good. Um, it's quite caramel. Again, that red fruit. The there's a, a raisiny type thing there. Um, sort of almost, almost, almost um, like fruit cake. Uh, it's lovely. It's really, really nice. Now, the, a lot of people think at forty percent, and that's the bare minimum of whiskey has to be. By law, it has to be forty percent. Sometimes. That alcohol level is too heavy for some of them, it's too high. And what you want to do is you want to put a little bit of water in and bring the, the alcohol by volume, the ABV, down. Don't put too much in. This is the key. Now when I say put water in, for a 35 ml measure, half a teaspoon of water. That'll take the ABV down from, say, 40% down to maybe 35. Don't drown it. You want to put it in in small amounts. Now, any whiskey shouldn't really take any more than one, one and a half teaspoons maximum. Uh, if it needs more than that, it's not a good whiskey. There's something badly wrong with it. Now, you can buy much higher ABV whiskies. Um, I reviewed my last one was a cask strength. Basically, it came straight from the cask, straight into the bottle, and it's 55.75% alcohol. The human body's not really designed to drink that level of alcohol. Now this one, this is all part of, this was the Cologne Chicolina cask finish, which I had to learn how to say because I'd never heard of it before. Uh, and at 55.75, it needs about three and a half teaspoons of water to bring it down to open it up to where it needs to be. So work with it. You know, you can spend an, an hour drinking one little glass of whiskey. You know, this is, this is what this is for. It's an experience. So when you get it, you nose it, you taste it. Let it go around your mouth. Coat your mouth. Nice oily feel. You know that quality? You know whenever you've, you slam a car door, whenever you close a car door, you know the difference between a quality one and one that's not. You know, your, your, your Dacia Sandero versus your, your Rolls Royce. There's a difference. You know this. And that you just know this as care has been taken over this, the time and effort has been done on this, you know. So, you taste them. Now, you follow through. This is equally important. When you've drank your whiskey, a quality product, it keeps going, it develops. I can still taste the last sip I had of that. It develops. Um, with the pot still whiskies, there's that little spice. Now, it goes through a, a chain of different tastes after you have, after you've swallowed. First note I get, um, sort of 60, 70% dark chocolate. Um, it's now going through, it's almost, almost slight ginger taste to it. Um, quite a little bit of spice. Um, sort of peanut, hazelnut type, nutty flavor. Um, yeah, but this is my opinion. There's no hard and fast rules to this. You, what you taste is what you taste. I did a, a, a tasting one night over in McHugh's, um, over uh, beside the Albert Clark, wonderful bar. The staff in it are amazing. I would recommend that. And I asked people, what do you, what do you taste? What, what are you getting from this? And everybody, everybody's scared in case there's a wrong answer. And I said, guys, just whatever it is, it is what it is. 
And the guy says, well, it's, it smells exactly like one of my granny's cupboards. And it was perfect. It's perfect. It was that oak, uh, that clean sort of chemical thing that sometimes you get off of whiskey. It's not, the, it's not bad. It's, that's what it is. It's, it's that sort of um, nice sort of clean, fresh oak wooden thing. And he got that. And that was perfect. And, it, and in a split second, he went from a, just drinking a whiskey to reminiscing about his grandmother. And that, that's kneeled on. That was perfect. It is what you want it to be. I can sit here and rhyme off it. I don't know, it smells of geraniums and, and split peas. It doesn't matter, it's up to you. Now, when you take it, do the nose, do the, do the palate, do your tasting, then do your uh, finish and think about it. Get your friends around, have a, a, a decent drink. Uh, in Scotland, they call it a dram. I prefer to call it a half one. Uh, it's a 35 mil measure and have a half in a whiskey. Now, the, when people ask me, is that worth it? I don't know. I can only ever rank it with what I consider to be value for money. Um, there's some there that I, are quite cheap. I don't think they're even worth that. There's other whiskies. This, this is about 100 pounds a ball, near enough, maybe 80, 90 pounds a ball. Is it worth it? Yes, absolutely. Um, is this one worth it? Well, yes, because I didn't pay for it, but it's worth it even if I was paying for it because I, I, I was, I was, it was a gift and, and I remember the person that gave me it every time I, I open it up. So, in conclusion, this, get your Glencairn glass, get a proper whiskey glass, get a proper whiskey, get a couple of friends around and try them. There is such a range of flavours. You can have it from everything from something like light tea to, to heavy treacle, uh, down at your, your sort of heavy bone wars and stuff. You know, there, there's lots and lots of range of these. So when people say they don't like whiskey, they probably haven't found the right one. Now, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, I wish you had come on a tour, on a walking tour, but uh, uh, thank you very much. What about that experience? Now, uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs>